60 years ago this month, Canadians elected a government that came in with very low expectations. The government was led by Lester Pearson, whose tenure as Liberal leader began with the worst thrashing in history at the time at the hands of the Conservatives and John Diefenbaker in 1958. Pearson lost the ensuing election as well, and sure looked like he'd be unable to parlay his time as a Nobel Prize winning foreign minister into becoming prime minister. But Pearson won on his third attempt and ushered in five years of some of Canada's most impactful administration ever. And that's how you get an airport in Canada's biggest city named after you. Anthony Anderson is a senior fellow at the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History. He's also the author of The Diplomat, Lester Pearson and the Suez Crisis, and he joins us now for more. Anthony, it's good to see you again. Good to be here. Thanks for coming in. Let's go back to the time before Pearson was prime minister. He's Canada's, as they then called it, mm -hmm. external affairs minister, right. basically mm -hmm. the foreign minister, and he wins the Nobel Prize for what? Pearson wins the prize because he was able to solve the Suez Crisis. That's when England, France, and Israel invaded Egypt. Pearson went to the UN and convinced the General Assembly to create the world's first peacekeeping force. It goes to Egypt, separates everyone, creates the peace. And uh, he wins the prize, and the most important thing about that afterwards is that it hands him the liberal leadership on a platter. There'd been other contenders, but once Pearson gets the prize, he sort of anointed the golden boy, and he becomes liberal leader in January 58. First ballot. Over Paul First Martin ballot. Sr. Yeah. One and only ballot. No contest. Yeah. <clears throat> everyone called him, I mean, his name's Lester, but everyone <clears throat> called him Mike. Yeah. Why'd they call him Mike? As the story goes, and I'm not sure I entirely believe it, um, when he was a young guy signing up for the Royal Flying Corps, his commanding officer looked at him and went, Lester, that's no name for a fighter pilot. I'm going to call you Mike. Again, I'm not sure I entirely believe it, but the story sticks and the nickname stuck, and that's how we remember him. He's Mike. always been Mike Pearson yeah. since then. Okay, Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent loses the 57 election mm. for the Liberals. Lester Pearson wins the leadership in a landslide over Paul Martin Sr. Two months later, John Diefenbaker takes him to the woodshed in that 58 <laughs> election. 208 yeah. seats for the Tories, biggest majority government in Canadian history at the time. Yeah. Why was he such a bust the first time out of the gate? Pearson was not in his element. He was a diplomat. He was... Uh, trained to be polite to opponents, trained to have disagreements off, off screen, backstage. In politics, you're meant to shred your opponent, you're meant to criticize everything they do. He was, he was not a natural in that element. And he had the bad luck to be up against probably the greatest campaigner of the 20th century. I mean, Diefenbaker was electrifying. He roused the nation and, like you said, he got the, the largest majority in our history still today in terms of share of votes, share of seats. Brian Mulroney will quibble a bit. Brian Mulroney won more seats more in 84, seats, right. but not a greater percentage. Pearson loses the next election as well in 1962, but he brings Stephen Baker down a peg mm -hmm. to a minority government. Yeah. So give us a sense of what happened in those four years to make things problematic for Deef. Diefenbaker Baker is the author of his own misfortune, maybe like all of us, um, to be fair to Deef. I mean, he has good government for quite a while. He does good things. He brings the first woman into cabinet, the first indigenous person into the Senate. He extends the vote to uh, indigenous people, so a lot of good things, and his Bill of Rights. But uh, he begins to govern, he begins to make decisions, and as soon as you do that, you irritate people. So he cancels the Avro Arrow, um, and he goes after the governor of the Bank of Canada, James Coyne, and he makes it personal. Um, so by the time you get around to 62, um, Deef is looking weak, wounded, uh, bitter, and I think half his cabinet don't trust him anymore. In fact, they threatened to throw him out, didn't yeah, they? There was a yeah. mutiny at some point. So that takes us to 63. That 62 government didn't last very long. 63, Pearson finally makes the breakthrough. But even then, only with a minority government, and even then, he had a 20-point lead in the campaign, and he almost blew it. He only won by eight points on Election Day yeah. 60 years ago this month. What happened? How did he almost blow it? Again, it's Pearson outside his natural element, and the things that didn't matter in diplomacy begin to matter in politics, so that we noticed... Oh, he's got a lisp, he's got a thin voice, he doesn't project, he doesn't have a commanding presence. He used to wear a bow tie, and his guy said, lose the bow tie. You know, he used to, his thumbs used to stick out, and he would sort of give you sermons like, you know, the son of a Methodist minister he was. Um, he won the popular vote in 63, mm -hmm. and he got, I think, 41%. That should have given him a majority, but the luck of the draw, he ended up with a minority. So again, Pearson, you know, barely got over the finish line, but he did. He comes in in 63 promising what he calls 60 days of decision. Yeah. What does that refer to? Big mistake tactically. Um, Diefenbaker had looked like a very dithering, 
mismanaged, uh, incompetent administrators, the Liberals thought, hey, let's de promise decision making. They thought of 100 days, and Pearson said, no, this refers to Napoleon's 100-day march to Waterloo. And they said, you know, Mr. Pearson, no one knows that. Pearson was a history teacher, and he said, well, I can't say 100 days, I'll say 60. And that caused him no end of grief. Isn't that funny? <clears throat> he, he did resolve the nuclear missile issue, right? This was, this was a big issue during Deef's time mm. about whether or not Canada would accept Beaumark missiles yeah. on Canadian soil. How did he resolve that whole thing? He waffled a bit. I think Canadians were very split. I mean. We didn't want nuclear weapons. We knew we needed them against the Soviets. Pearson reflected that ambivalence. Diefenbaker reflected that ambivalence. Neither of them really had a clear answer. Pearson, in the end, said um, Diefenbaker had accepted the missiles without warheads. Pearson said, we'll take the warheads, but is there another role for us? So he kind of kicked the can down the road. April of 63, he wins his election. November of 63, anybody who's of a certain age is going to remember this. Pearson was the Prime Minister when President John F. Kennedy mm. was assassinated, and here is how he reacted back in November of 63. Sheldon, please. The Parliament of Canada was hushed this afternoon. The voice of party controversy was silenced. As I performed as Prime Minister the hard duty of announcing the sad news of the death of the President of the United States, a death so sudden and so shocking that it left us, as I'm sure it left you, stunned and unbelieving. Kennedy had a famously awful relationship with yeah. John Diefenbaker. What was his relationship like with Mike Pearson? They really liked each other. Pearson had the Nobel Prize. Kennedy came up to Ottawa at some point in Diefenbaker's tenure. There was a party at uh, 24 Sussex. Pearson was there. Kennedy spent all his time focused on Pearson. Hmm. And Diefenbaker never forgot that. <laughs> so they got along, and Pearson was a huge baseball fan, as was Kennedy. So, We used to have something in this country called the Pearson Cup, yeah. which was the championship, unofficial. When the Blue Jays played the Expos, whoever won that series won the person, Pearson right. Cup. Yeah. No more Expos, no yeah. more Pearson yeah. Cup. Anyway, yes, he was a huge baseball fan. Let's talk social programs. Tommy mm. Douglas, of course, is known as the father of Medicare because when he was Premier of Saskatchewan, he brought it in for that province. Yeah. But Pearson made it a national program. Yeah. How did that happen? It was more of an intra-liberal party fight. I mean, the party had pr promised something like it since 1919. Pearson, in opposition, I think made a real effort to say, whatever I say in opposition, I'm gonna try and do in government. They promised it in opposition, and uh, he announced it to the provinces who were kind of horrified that they would be picking up this huge tab. The Fed said, we'll pay 50-50. And uh, there was a delay, a one-year delay because um, they wanted to bring it in for uh, centennial year. And it was a huge, part, uh, huge fight within the party. And Pearson uh, looked, I guess, bad because he was delaying, but he was trying to be fiscally prudent as well. In the end, he listened to the progressive wing of the party and uh, enacted it. The Premier of Ontario at the time, a guy mm. named John Robarts, called Pearson's Medicare plan a Machiavellian scheme <laughs> because I think he foresaw a day yeah. when it wouldn't be a 50-50 cost-shared right. program. Yeah. And that's what we've got today. It's more like 75-25 yeah. yeah. today. I say give it to the feds. <laughs> Lose the provinces. <laughs> All right. He brought in the Canada Pension Plan as well. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? And often these things have nothing to do with the actual policy. It's interesting. Like Pearson wanted to bring in a pension plan. To do that, he had to talk to the provinces. Quebec wanted its own pension plan. And instead of really talking about the details, it got into this huge fight over jurisdiction. Quebec wanted to the pension fund to build up funds so that they could rebuild schools, highways, all of that kind of thing. Uh, Pearson had a very simple plan. In the end, he basically adopted the Quebec plan. And I think was, this was real genius on his part. He um, didn't get stuck in positions. And when he recognized Quebec had a better plan that would, would build up social capital, he um, let go. And it was part of his brilliance in diplomacy, don't get stuck in losing positions. Hmm. Made him look weak in politics, unfortunately. Okay, <clears throat> so we've talked about Medicare, we've talked about the pension plan. These are things that have survived to this mm. day because of the Lester Pearson government. This may be the biggest one of all, though. Sheldon, you want to bring this up? Okay, that's what our flag used to look like. That was called the Red Ensign. And obviously, with the Union Jack in the top left corner, it very much signified our ties to Great Britain. Pearson wanted something more uniquely Canadian. And that's what we got. 
<laughs> How did all that happen? Nearly cost him his government. Um, Pearson had spent his life as a diplomat serving under the Red Ensign. So whenever he showed up at a UN gathering, NATO, the Red Ensign would be there and people would say, sorry, are you the British or the Canadians? No, we're the Canadians. So against the advice of many of his advisors, because they just scraped through the pension plan battles, like by the skin of their teeth, they'd had their first moment of calm and Pearson went, now's the moment. So against all the advice, he launched it. A maple leaf didn't look like that at the beginning. There were two blue bars. There were three maple leaves. He took that into the House of Commons, and Diefenbaker, who was a staunch red ensign man, a staunch monarchist, erupted. And it was probably one of the most vicious parliamentary battles we've seen. The Tories said, we, we fought in World War yeah. I and II yeah. under that flag. Yeah. It was yeah. good enough then. Why yeah. isn't it good enough today? Yeah, I mean, I respect that. I remember interviewing Eric Nielsen, a former cabinet minister for Mulroney, who said that, he said, you know, I watched my comrades getting buried beneath the Red Ensign. So it was heartfelt and I, you know, with all respect to Diefenbaker and those guys um, and all the love they had for the Red Ensign, Pearson had a different idea of Canada. I think he had a different sense of where we were heading. Bilingualism made mm. its first significant strides under Lester Pearson and here's what he had to say about that 50 years ago in an interview with Larry Zolf. Mm. Sheldon, if you would. Bilingualism, I think, is essential in this country in the sense that where a knowledge of two languages is necessary, in areas where both languages are spoken, in the national capital, which is the capital of a bilingual country, in occupations like diplomacy, where French is really a very important language, in those occupations, in those situations, both languages must be understood and learned. Just before I get to bilingualism, I mean, there you go, right? <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. the bow tie, the yeah. squeaky voice, yeah. the lisp. Yeah. How'd that guy ever become successful in he, politics? He couldn't do it today. He could <laughs> not do it. No, it's quite true. Okay, Pierre Trudeau was really thought of as mm -hmm. being the prime minister who really made great strides when it came to official bilingualism mm -hmm. in Canada. But Pearson moved the ball down the field. Yeah. How did he do it? I think he, did a, I think he really did a lot of the hard work. He uh, made a very uh, significant speech in Parliament where he essentially said, to I'm sure Trudeau's horror, Quebec is not a province like the others. It is a nation unto itself. We need to recognize the difference, re almost recognize it as a distinct society. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was, I think, what I, I like so much about Pearson is that he has um, this incredible sense of generosity and a real sense of inclusion. Quebec was a second, or I should say, Francophones were second class citizens in those days. They didn't sit on boards. They didn't sit in the highest posts of government. Um, it's hard to believe now, but they really were second class and Pearson wanted a confederation of equals. So he launched the Royal Commission on Bilingualism, which Diefenbaker hated, thought it would tear the country apart. Pearson took the risk, and I think underlying all of that was his sen the sense that he was asking all of us to imagine a much different country. Hmm. When 1967 came along, mm. Canada celebrated its centennial. I think people may remember our 150th birthday celebration mm. a few years ago, and it was very Muted, yeah. I think is the way to say yeah. it. What was it like in 67? It was a glorious celebration. I was too young to remember it, but from everything I've seen, like we were feeling confident, cocky. It was a lucky place to be, this country. Hmm. Just as Jean Chrétien was asked by George W. Bush to support the American war effort mm. in Iraq, Chrétien declined. President Lyndon Johnson asked Lester Pearson for Canada's support for the war in Vietnam. Pearson declined. In fact, he went to Temple University in Philadelphia and he urged the United States to stop bombing. How did LBJ react to that? It is one of the great stories in Canadian foreign policy. Um, Lyndon Johnson was a cantankerous, bumptious guy, uh, huge temper tantrums. Pearson made a bit of a diplomatic faux pas. He did not warn the Americans in advance because he knew they would shoot it down. So he said the speech, think about a pause in the bombing, um, he goes to Camp David, they're supposed to have a lunch, Johnson is picking at his food, not looking at Pearson, taking phone calls, and Pearson knows a storm is coming. And then he said something like, what would you think of my speech? Pearson asked Johnson. Johnson, and Johnson erupts, pulls him out to the, the porch that apparently wraps around Camp David, and our, um, our uh, ambassador in Washington, Charles Ritchie, is looking through the window and can see screaming, Johnson waving his hands. In one version of the story, he grabs Pearson by the lapel and says, you can't come here and piss on my rug. 
And Johnson, to be fair, was right to be irritated that something like this was said in his backyard without warning. It was a rare faux pas for Pearson, but I think he was also trying to tell Johnson that if you go too far, it's going to be a quagmire you won't get out of for a long time. One of the things that made Pearson's <clears throat> government and cabinet unique is that he had mm -hmm. a lot of future prime ministers in that cabinet. Yeah. Let's bring up this shot here. This is one of the most famous shots yeah. in Canadian political history. That's Pierre Trudeau on the left, John Turner beside him, Mike Pearson in the middle, and Jean Chrétien to the right. You've got four prime ministers, present and future, in that one shot. He seemed to put his thumb on the scale mm. for Trudeau when it came time for him to leave and a successor to be crowned. Why did he do that? He really wanted a francophone successor. His first choice was Jean Marchand, who was the labor minister and the guy who actually pulled Trudeau into cabinet. Trudeau wasn't a star when he came. He was sort of a nobody, um, in the, in, in sort of nationally. But he quickly emerged as the justice minister. And Pearson, I don't know if he did anything directly for Trudeau, but he let it be known informally that he was the guy. Well, he brought him into cabinet as justice minister pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. and set up national tours for his justice minister to go out and have constitutional negotiations with the premiers and so on. Yeah, people were bitter about that. Yeah. Like Paul Hellyer, the John Turner minister. was too. <laughs> both, pretty, yeah. both pretty bitter about yeah. it. But it, 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 was, it certainly was an attempt by Pearson to favor Trudeau. To f yeah, I mean, he wanted a francophone successor and, he, and Pearson said that he would be the last unilingual prime minister. And I guess I think he, he was. everyone. Yeah. yeah, you cannot become prime minister, and that is that's part of his legacy. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are, sixty years later, mm. after his first becoming prime minister of Canada. He's the guy they named the airport after. Yeah. How should we remember him? I think it's the great innovator, the great catalyst. Uh, he left behind a very different Canada than the one he inherited. You know, Diefenbaker was a very, in a way, unilingual. Anglophone, British centric Canada, Pearson pointed towards the future. And I think he left behind a much more inclusive, generous Canada. He only served five years as yeah. Prime Minister. Yeah. Actually, not even. Five years Barely. minus a few yeah. days. Yeah. How come? He, could, he knew he couldn't win another election. He didn't want to fight another election. He'd fought so many. He was also 70 at that point. I think he was feeling mm. quite burnt out. And when you look at what he'd done, what else was there to do? I mean, he'd left behind such an incredible legacy. Pierre Trudeau tended to get a lot of the credit for it, but Pearson really put into place the Canada that I took for granted for a very long time. Can you imagine if Pearson were around today, he left at 70, there's an 80 yeah. year old president of the United yeah. States today? Kind of makes you reevaluate how old is too old to be a first yeah. leader these days. I mean, I think he was, I think he was tired. He'd been through some bruising elections and he'd watched Louis Saint Laurent stay on way too long, so mm -hmm. I don't think he wanted to repeat that mistake. Where's he buried? He's buried in a lovely country cemetery um, just outside the town of Wakefield in the Gatineau Hills. In Quebec? In Quebec. Does anybody know why? Because he's from here. He's from Toronto originally. Yeah, he had, he's buried next to two friends, two old friends from external affairs. And at some point in the 1940s, they found that spot and decided the three of them would be buried together. Sweet. Yeah. If he were alive today, I mean, you've written this book about him. Mm. You certainly studied as much as anybody in this country. You've studied his career. You must have at some point thought to yourself, if I ever had the chance to interview this guy, <laughs> here's what I'd want to know. What would you want to know? What would you ask him? Not a great question. I dreamed about him when I was writing the book. And there's always that horrible thing, and I'm sure you must have felt it writing your books. You're just chasing the memoirs, chasing the archives, chasing the bits of paper. He was, uh, he was a diplomat to the end. I don't know how much he would have revealed. I would like to have known more about his fight with Johnson on that porch hmm. after the speech his dealings with Mackenzie King. I mean, he started in the age of Queen Victoria and he died in the age of Aquarius. So there's so much history there. And, uh, and yeah, he didn't reveal all he knew. Ain't it the truth. 60 years ago this month, Lester Pearson became our prime minister and Anthony Anderson has been our guest. He of the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History. And if you want to read a good book about Pearson's time as foreign minister, The Diplomat, Lester Pearson and the Suez Crisis. Anthony, thanks a lot for coming. Thanks, Steve. In. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.